go away, I'll get clean, and then I'll get the money, and then when I come back, I'll be sorted. To take my daughter with me, because it would look better, you know, they would never suspect. Kakoka. Shit, that's definitely not supposed to be happening. You're gonna get sentenced to 10 years in prison. It was literally a war because there's like 400 men on one side and 300 men on another side all trying to kill each other with grenades and machine guns and they'd line them up against the wall and they would get them to drop their trousers and then like beat them on the back of their legs and on their asses and stuff like that. Every day I used to think that the next day somebody would come and get me and take me out of there. In today's world, there are so many incredible and extraordinary stories of survival. Stories about fighting against the odds, overcoming the toughest situations and never giving up. Stories that need to be told and heard. Stories that can change our perspective on life, offer us empowerment, teach us how to deal with difficulties and give us inspiration to find inner strength. My name is Iris Enthoven and you're now listening to They Survived. In this week's episode, we will talk to Natalie Wells, who was caught trying to smuggle 300,000 pounds worth of cocaine at the Venezuelan airport in 2001. She took her four-year-old daughter as a cover, but this only resulted in an emotional split up. She was sentenced to 10 years in one of the deadliest prisons in South America. A place few enter and even fewer leave. Surprisingly enough, she managed to escape after having a relationship with a prison guard. After an incredible trip, she made it back to England. Her story of addiction, smuggling, prison life and escape is not one of despair, but of hope and determination. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Thanks, thanks for having Happy me. Happy to have you here. Mm, thank you. Yeah, let's start at the beginning to learn a little bit more about how you ended up in a situation. Uh -huh. um, could you tell us a little bit more about your situation as a teenager? Yeah, I grew up in quite an unhappy family home. Um, my, my mum and dad were separated before I was born. My earliest memories uh, of my mum and her partner, who was my stepdad. And my stepdad was, he was really abusive, like physically and mentally. Um, and I don't really have any happy memories of childhood. So I naturally, rebelled against um, my stepdad and then because of that became a, a problem child yes. rather than like people kind of figuring out what was going on and why was this child behaving in this negative way um, it was just I was just a naughty child you know but then like my mum and stepdad they put on um, a really good rent as well of it being like the perfect family family home and there not really being any explanation yes for this you know badly behaved daughter of theirs so um i just grew up like really angry and um, with the world um and then i got put into a children's home i went to a really good school um, I went to grammar school mm -hmm. and I really struggled there with the social dynamics of everything. Yes. Um, because I think that's where I started to, that was when I recognized that I was in a dysfunctional family unit. Yes. Because you don't realize at first, because you just think every, every family is the same. Yeah. And then when I started getting invited around like other people's houses and stuff after school, that's when I really kind of like realized that. You know, they're, they're, it wasn't supposed to be like that. So I started rebelling at school and um, I felt like such a, a misfit as well. So I ended up in a children's home. So your, so your mother and stepdad put you there or was it like it was like a, mm, so It was a joint kind Decision, of... Yeah. Well, I mean, the I'd run away. Okay. I can't... I, my stepdad had locked me in my bed while well, in the house and um, I hadn't even wanted to go out, but I'd been like walking down the stairs to go into the kitchen, I think. And he just like ran to the doors and locked all the doors and said that I wasn't going out. So I took that as a challenge to find a way out. Yes. I broke out through my bedroom window and I was out all night. I'd been running away from home a lot as well because I just didn't want to be there. 
um because it was just horrendous all the time and then and there was no consistency with my stepdad either he just never knew it was just like walking on eggshells all the time you know like he could just blow up for yeah. no reason um so i ran away and the police found me i can't remember where they got me and they took me back home but then my stepdad refused to let me go home um and to let me go in and um which i was happy with because i didn't want to i didn't want to go back home so then the police took me to the police station and then they had to contact social services and then social services then put me into the children's home i understand were you happy with the choice yeah <laughs> yeah um just i just didn't want to be at home like it was just torture all the time like i said like physically and yes. mentally and my stepdad was you know it was he was just hurting me and it was just this living in this constant fear um and i'd grown up like that i was i think i was 12 or 13 years old at this point so mm -hmm. to just grow up as this child living in constant fear of this kind of monster of a man yes um yeah, I was more than happy to to be in the children's home. How was the children's home? But it wasn't very good. I mean, f I had a great time, but there there were no consequences to actions. There was no. We just ran riots. I think really because nobody had any authority over mm -hmm. us. You know, we're, there's you've got there was like f about. 30 odd of us in there maybe more yes all troubled children all come in from troubled backgrounds none of us have really any respect for adults or authority so we just ran riot and we could just do what we wanted so for example we'd go out catch a bus into town and then like the social workers would say, right, well, you've got to be at this pickup point at, you know, six o'clock. And you just wouldn't be there. You just go yeah. out and do what you want and ring them up at three o'clock in the morning and say, come and get me. And they have to come and get you. Yeah. And then you go back and then the next day you go into the office and say, well, can I have my clothing allowance? You know, my money for my clothing allowance. And they've got to give it you. So there was just no, we can't, you know, they, they say, oh, you're grinding. You can't go out, but they can't stop you from going out yes. so there's no no rules really. yeah, yeah there's no there's no rules really was this also like the place where yeah where you started using drugs and got addicted yeah um i don't know i didn't get i don't know if i yeah, i got addicted to speed in the children's home um i started using amphetamines first of all because I got into a relationship with my social worker um, and I was quite young and he was a lot older and um, How old were you? I was younger than I should have been okay and he was old enough to know better okay um so that just really messed with my head as well and especially because I was supposed to be in this safe environment and now here I was again being abused really i mean i i don't think i realized it at the time i thought i was in love yes but from his position it's totally it unacceptable you know now yes. that i'm older and and things like that that's that's it's not acceptable but it was a relationship or it, yeah. yeah yeah i mean it went on for many years we have a child together he lost his job because of it okay, but it was just massively confusing for me like this whole time and then as the relationship started to come out, I, I really felt like I was the culprit, you know, instead yes. of being, I don't want to say victim, you know, because I really don't like that word, but it was really put on me by social services. Their attitude towards me was quite aggressive. They wanted the whole thing just, you know, kept quiet and brushed under the carpet. And I just, I didn't get any support that's when I started experimenting with amphetamine. Um, and I was just, I was just taking it. I ended up in hospital like the first time I took it because I just took way too much. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I think it was a cry for help. Like looking back on it, yes. I think I was just desperate for a help. But I had 
like the the social worker that I was having an affair with telling me all the time that nobody could know and and he was just uh, lying to me all the time telling me that you know he loved me because he was married with kids and he was going to leave his going to leave his wife and we just had to wait until I could, could move out of the children's home when I was 16 and we'd be together and you know it was just uh, and this was a person that was supposed to be like, helpful yes. and, and protecting me from kind of like predatory men really and um, so it was just a uh, a difficult time for me and a, a minefield of emotions that I was trying to well, I wasn't very emotionally stable anyway you know so it was a lot to try and to try and figure out and try and deal with was the drugs to sort of uh you escape yeah totally yeah yeah absolutely it was um I don't know and it was kind of exciting as well you know because not that many people were were doing it I don't know I started to like bond with other people through the through the drug you experienced right away that you got that you felt like a sort of addiction or was it like um up? i don't i don't know like i think like with the with the amphetamine i, I it did kind of take con control quite quickly but it it also kind of came to an end i think it lasted maybe um a couple of years And can you take us from there? Because you were telling already together you, you had a child. Yeah. What happened after? So um, we left the children's home. And I was got I was pregnant really quickly. Um, none of the things happened that he said was going to happen. Even his wife. Even his wife. Oh God, and yes. us being together and all this kind of stuff. So none of that happened. I was just, I started to feel more and more like this dirty little secret that was being moved around from, you know, he'd find me different places to to stay in and um, put me up sometimes for like friends of his that had spare rooms to stay in. And um, yeah, I started to, I think with age and maturity, I, I started to... To want more, you know, and I got fed up of feeling like this dirty, dark little like secret. I made a group of friends. I got in with a group of friends, and it was the first time I think that I felt like I was kind of doing something normal. Now these this group of friends were the same age. They had they'd all grown up with their families and had nice family lives and by this point they had cars and we started going to the pub and I felt like I was doing things that I should be doing mm -hmm. that are normal I think I was 17 18 and I felt like I was doing the things that normal 17 18 year olds do and then I started to feel embarrassed with this social worker um he was a lot older he was grossly overweight um and i'd be at the pub with my friends and he would turn up and i it just i'd f just feel uncomfortable and cringe and i think then i just realized this is not this Good is all, no yes. yeah it's yeah. not right so i put an end to to the relationship okay and also because at that point you were also a mom already yeah so how was this Well, he wasn't supportive in really well in any way, so it didn't affect like splitting up with ending the relationship didn't affect the parenting at all. I was struggling, I was all by myself, like I didn't get much family support either. I didn't have my mum supporting me. I was just I didn't really I didn't have very good role models. I was just trying to figure it figure it out for myself yes. and do the best that that I could um and I th at that point I was doing all right considering the circumstances um like we had an apartment and my daughter was going to she was I was taking her to all the nursery groups and she had the toys and the feeding and yeah at that point it was it was going it was going well really and I was doing I, I couldn't criticize myself then for my parenting um but then 
my drug addiction, my drug swapped. Then like we were going out when this group of friends and we were going out and we were going to um, raves and rave clubs mm -hmm. and um, I'd have babysitters when I was doing that and we'd be taking you know, pills and whatnot, which was kind of normal then, you know, that's what a lot of, it was a big scene. It was what a lot of um, people were doing. I then had pack cocaine introduced to me and then that was just a whole that was just a whole game changer like my whole world just came tumbling down so rapidly so quickly you wouldn't even think it was possible for a life to change like and um, a person's mental health and what they think of themselves and their perspective like it was just so super quick it was just yes. insane so straight away you got addicted to instantly yes. yeah 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 instantly like um a couple of weeks like it happened within yeah. within two weeks yeah within two weeks i'd lost the group of friends that i'd been with i was integrating with a new group of people that were crack dealers, crack addicts, gangsters that had come over from mm -hmm. Jamaica. I was in like this just whole new world and it was almost like I was this new thing for it to feed off, you know, yes. and it just like welcomed me in and just sucked the life out of me. Like everybody was just like kind of like feed off me and get their bit out of me and yeah, it was crazy. So in a short amount of time, everything changed. Yeah, massively, yeah. hugely. And can you tell me about this group? Because this is also the group yeah, who sort of invited you into the smuggling, right? Yeah, there was a there was, there was a huge Yardi community, which is a Jamaican gangster community where I was living, and they it was it was just a network. Mm -hmm. They were so professionally organized. It was just a network of them, and they were they were bringing their friends over from Jamaica, and then getting their friends married to people like me and other addicts so that they could have papers. Um, and then they just had a whole operation where they had um, flats and houses set up and people out on the streets and they were going out like actively looking and encouraging new people to get on the on the drug, you know, giving them free drugs and to make, get them addicted, yeah, yeah, and inviting them round to the crack houses oh, and so. saying, "Come round," and yeah, so it's so easy. So you lived in the crack house? Or no, just... I, I was no, I didn't. Okay. I was spending time though. I was they were sending taxes to come and pick me up, like someone would knock on my door oh, and really? be like, "Oh, there's a taxi here," and so and so and so and so said, "Come round there and have a smoke with them." And mm -hmm. so you think everybody is your your friend, yes. you know? Um, well, I did anyway, you know, because yeah. I was I was young and naive and, and to be honest, desperate for friends as well and desperate to fit in somewhere and, and now like kind of desperate for this for this drug as well. Yeah, so also raising a child. Or yeah, having trying this, to. Yeah, yeah, trying to raise yeah, a child yeah. Or at a this point addiction. doing quite badly. Yeah. Um, but luckily, like, I mean, I was trying my best and then like my friends, some of the, well, some of my friends, some of the people that I was hanging around with um they also had kids as well okay so we'd kind of like try and keep the kids together like playing somewhere whilst we like sneak into another room to do drugs and yes and at what point did they sort of recruit you to get into smuggling I think it had been a couple of years I was deeply involved then I, I knew everybody I knew all the dealers they all knew me one of them propositioned to me. They just they did a good sales pitch, made it sound easy, offered me money, which to me sounded like a lot of money. And it was an escape as well. Um, like when so first of all, I was offered to do trips to Holland. I asked if I could go on a boat to Holland, and people would meet me in Holland stay there a night or two and that some people would meet me in Holland and that uh, they'd give me we'd go to an apartment they'd give me some packages I'd, I'd strap the packages to me to my waist bring the parcels back and then get paid and it was all very glamorous because they had so we'd get the boat from the job would be going from 
carriage mm-hmm. to I think it's Hook, Hook Van Hook Holland. Holland. Hook yeah. Van Holland. <laughs> so you're stomping yes. around <laughs> into that's my country. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but like the house that we would stay in in Harwich, um, it was a, a house that they'd rented. Nobody lived in it, but it was so glamorous. You know, it was huge and it had um, a massive, huge cream leather sofas and marble work yes. tops and swimming pool and it was just all so glamorous and when I was there I was out of my hometown Gloucester and when I was there I just I wasn't I wasn't smoking the drugs and I was just I was so embarrassed and ashamed of my habit that I couldn't turn to anybody like all my decent friends had distanced themselves from me. They tried to help me in the beginning when they'd seen what had happened, and I just pushed them away because I I couldn't admit, I couldn't even admit to myself to begin with. I just, I kept joking to myself, that um, kidding myself that I would stop. You know, next time I got money, I wouldn't do it. And it was, I was just kidding myself. To get away from the area was to get away from the drugs, and it was just, I started fantasizing about making money, working for these people, not taking drugs, you know, staying yes. away. I just needed the the break away from it. So it was like for the money, but also in your head, like going away from yeah. the situation you're in. Yeah. Yeah. Because I said to myself, right, well, I'll go away, I'll get clean and then I'll get the money. And then when I come back, I'll be sorted and I won't start over again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which but it- didn't, didn't work no. no no it was the first thing I did so it's what I mean it's just like just the the kidding myself in in my mind all the time yeah so I'd go away then I'd meet other people that were doing it and they were doing like international journeys and I'd see their houses and they had nice houses nice stuff um very glamorous clearly not on drugs and and I wanted some of that yes um but when I got back, you know, and I had a couple of thousand in my pocket and it would always be the same thing. Like, right, well, I'll, I'll just get a 10 stone. Got like two, two, two grand in my pocket and be like, I'll just get like one. And, but it doesn't work like that. That's why it's so addictive. You know, it's once it's got its hold on you, it's really got its claws right in there. Yes. Yeah. So I'd come back with the money, think, oh, I'll just have one and, and not stop until the money had gone, you know, and then being exactly the same position that I was in before I left. And then wanted to go on another trip for the money. Yeah. yeah so again, and goes, again, the same yeah, thing, you know, right, okay, well, I did that that time. Yes. So when I come back next time, I won't do that. Yeah. And it was just the same vicious circle over and over again. Yes. So it started with some uh, trips to Holland. Yeah. And after that, you were also going on an international trip. Yeah. I got offered a job going to Jamaica. Yes. So I was proper. I was super excited about that. Um, who doesn't want to go to Jamaica? So I went to Jamaica, but then when I got there, it all fell apart because somebody in the UK, like a, a rival dealer, uh, had found out that I was in Jamaica and that I was supposed to be bringing stuff back. So he told the police uh, and told the person that I was working for that he'd told the police because he didn't want the drugs coming back in because I wasn't working for him. They were coming in for his rival. So I got a free holiday out of that one. But it was still quite difficult. And they like, um, and I'm glad because when I got there, they wanted me to, to swallow it. And I was like, I'm not doing that. Like uh-huh. that hadn't been like arranged with me or anything. So I came back from that one empty-handed. So they asked you in Jamaica, don't go with anything because we're Yeah, snakes. well, the the person that I was working for in the UK, yes. he, I was communicating with him and he said to me, like, don't, don't bring anything back. Uh, and then when I landed uh, in the airport, I can't remember what I did, I think it must have been, I think it was Heathrow, they were waiting for me. The police, yeah. so they were yeah, informed. They, they, yeah. yeah, they were so happy definitely. For you, yeah, you didn't took anything. Yeah, they back. were definitely informed. But I can imagine that the people who were you working for must have been angry or yeah, they weren't happy. No, they were really annoyed with me because did they pay you? No. Oh, okay. Oh, though, and they left me out there with no money. It was a real struggle. I had no money, no food. Oh my god. Yeah, it was yeah. really tough. I had to go to like this. Um, 
a police and order some food and then tell them for me and my daughter and then tell them that I couldn't pay for it because I didn't have any money. Okay. Yeah, and then I tried to come back early. I spent, like, my last bit of money getting a taxi to the airport because... I think I just thought I could just be able to get... I didn't really know anything about planes. I think it was the first time... It was the the first time I'd ever been abroad on a plane. So I thought I could just go to the airport and say, right, I've got this ticket for next Thursday, but I'd like to go home today, please. Ah, and it's like, like I'd train tickets. Yeah, yeah it but it doesn't work like that. No. So then I got there and they're like, well, there are no tickets, you know, that is the first flight back next to, and it wasn't for like three or four days away or something. Yes. So then I'm like stranded then at the airport and I'd try and get back to where I was staying. And oh, it was a nightmare. took their hands off you, like... There's nothing yeah. she can take back, so she's not like our yeah. uh, responsibility. Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah, well they don't care, do they? No. You know? Obviously. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They don't they don't care. You're um, just um expendable. Yes. And, um, and after this, uh so you you didn't work with this group anymore? No, yeah, okay. I did that was the last time I did anything for for them. Then I got introduced to somebody else. Um, and he just seemed a lot different to other people that I'd been working with. He didn't speak with the yardy accent. He was Jamaican, but he spoke correctly. He didn't carry himself like a gangster. He dressed smart. Treated me nice again, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, it's all part of the the fishing, isn't it? To get you in then like yes. real, real you into in. it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I thought that he was different. And then he introduced me to some other people that were working for him and everyone was just so lovely to me and treated me really nice and took me shopping and spent money on me. And they offered me a trip to Venezuela. They did such a good sales pitch. But again, you know, my brain was just so foggy and clouded by addiction and, you know, the just the life that I'd been having really you know I just yes. didn't at that point in my life I just don't think I ever made any sensible decisions because I didn't I just didn't know what was what's the right thing to do and and um I didn't have a support network around me so I just had a whole team of professionals telling me everything's going to be okay and you know obviously It's not going to be okay if you if you do things like that. So, but I was just stupid. Yeah, so um, you, you yeah. decided to go on a trip? Yeah. And you, you also took your daughter with you. What was yeah. the reason for that? Well, because they told me that it was, there was like, there was a girl that was part of the team and she'd been there like multiple times. She'd done this journey that I was doing multiple times and she said that there was people there waiting at the other end that they look after you that it's all everyone in the airport's paid off she's done it successfully and they said that to take my daughter with me because it would look better you know they would never suspect anybody like that and it would be easy like for the people to identify me the people that have been paid off it'd be easy for them to identify me and you know, nothing would ever happen because I have my daughter with me. Uh, and, you know, and as I'm saying it, I can hear how ridiculous, like, it, it all is. They're just saying whatever they need to say to, to for go, me, yeah. yeah, for me to do the the job. But was there like a moment you were in a doubt to take your daughter or, or go on a trip? Yeah, when I was in the airport, we missed the plane. So we we went from England to Holland and was flying from Amsterdam. And the person that I was working for came came with me. Okay. And he came with me to the airport. And oh, we missed the plane the first time. That was it. Yes. We got there too late. I don't think we'd left the hotel early enough in the morning. I think he had a hangover. Okay, so, so he you was went up, yeah. partying or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we was up late. So we didn't get to the airport the first time. So there's warning number one yeah. that I just ignored like don't go yeah exactly um I didn't take any notice of that so then I came back to the UK for a week and then went back there again and again my boss came with me to the airport and it was really strange because I was 
I was sat in the airport and I just had this this feeling come over me, which I now recognise as like the universe screaming at me, don't do it. Yeah, I've like never felt instinct. yeah, totally, yeah. totally. But I didn't know anything about things like that. I am um, then you had this bad feeling something's yeah, about to happen. Yeah. And then I said to my boss, I said to him, oh, I've got a really funny feeling. And he, he actually said, Don't don't do it. Don't have to you don't have to do this. Um don't worry about it don't do it if that's how you feel but I wanted to work for him I wanted to impress him I could see all these other people that were working for him and the money they were earning and the clothes they were wearing and the lifestyle that they had and, and I wanted some of that I wanted to be jetting all over the place all what over was the, the world. money they offered you for this trip oh god it wasn't much four thousand four thousand yeah and were you to, like, to me that was a lot of money yeah, of course you yeah know? But, but like you were not aware of the risk involving this trip or no the money like no especially in yeah like or how much they were making oh, yeah, of course, you know yeah. like they're, they're making tens of thousands of pounds you know so i didn't know how much they were making but just to me it was a know, lot of money 400 pounds was a lot of money you yes. know i hadn't really ever had a, a a proper job you know i'd been living on benefits struggling with drug addiction you know i'd never heard of figures like that yeah. you know to me four thousand was like forty thousand. it was yes, a, it was I a lot understand. of money yes yeah and so you went on a trip was there yeah. anybody telling you to not take your daughter or like there was one girl there was a one girl that was part of the crew angie i think we called her i seriously doubt that that was her name i doubt that was any of their names just before i was going she said Don't take you can you know don't take her and leave her here like with with her to leave my daughter with her. Okay. And I just thought I can't do that. You're a, I don't know who really. Now I've I've known you of a couple of weeks. Now um I don't really know who you are. My, I can't leave my daughter with you. And it's all part of the plan anyway. I can't turn up like my daughter because it's she's she, part of the she's plan. She's part of it. Yes. Yeah. I understand. So you took off. Yeah. It was just bad from the beginning, like right from the very beginning. So there was supposed to be someone waiting for me at the airport and there was nobody there waiting for me. So I didn't have a clue. I didn't, I had no money. I didn't know where, like where I was going, what I was doing. I was just like at this airport completely lost. And then, so I phoned up the person that I was working for and he seemed really confused as well. So right from the go get, it wasn't, it wasn't good. So then the person I was working for in the, in the UK, he told me where to go um, and told me to get a taxi to this hotel. And I got to the hotel, got taken to my chalet, and then the phone rang. The person that I was, my contact at that end, introduced himself and told me to wait there to not leave my room or anything and he'd come and see me like the next day but I couldn't do that because I have my daughter with me it's boiling hot there's no air conditioning it's quite a cheap rundown hotel um, and I was just I was angry at this point because I was not expecting like I'd been treated so well before mm -hmm. by these people that I was working with and and how I'd heard that the contact at that end treated you was quite good. So I was just not expecting any of that. So he came like the next day. I just didn't like him straight away. He just, he gave me the creeps. He wasn't very nice. And then he just took me back to the hotel room and just pretty much abandoned me like for the whole, I think I was there for like 10 days or something really? like that. Yeah, yeah. And just like, I mean, it was an all inclusive hotel. But yeah, I kind of thought, I was told, oh, he'll pick you up, he'll take you out, you'll do nice things, yeah. you'll go nice places, and he just... He just yeah, in yeah, 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 he just completely abandoned me until the day before I was flying. So um, just the whole... There were just warning bells ringing, like the yes. whole... From before I'd even got there, there was just warning bells ringing the whole time. Yes, so uh, how many days before the flight 
back he gave you the stuff it was i think it was the night before so he he picked me up actually he picked me up took my suitcase we went off he told me to bring my suitcase but not to have anything in it and we went off and he took me to like a, a barrio it was quite run down and told me to wait in the car and he had minders like with me waiting with me and he took my suitcase and went into a, a shady looking building and he was in there for quite a while and then he came out with another suitcase and then took me back to the hotel um and he he told me in the car he told me that um everyone had been paid off he told okay. me that in the airport the airport people had been paid off he said that the again i'm like as i say it i just i i can't believe how kind of gullible and and naive i was but that's what they're relying on i suppose aren't they so he told me that the the national guards in the airport and the security in the airport they knew who i was they'd been paid off he said that he told me that they would come but they would pull me to one side oh really and yeah and just as yeah, a sort of mask. yeah yeah and he said for me like not to worry and that that was all part of the plan uh and then that was it and then he left me and then, like, I was really worried because I could just, I could smell the glue. Like, they, it smelled like they just, I could just smell the glue from the suitcase. Because they opened the suitcase, yeah. put the drugs into it and glued it. Yeah, they'd yeah. made a false bottom. I so understand. they, like, took out the lining, put the drugs in there, and then put the light, like a false bottom, and then put the lining back on. How many drugs was it? Or what, what kind of drugs was it? It was cocaine. Cocaine, okay, Yeah, yes. and it was um, five kilos. Five kilos. Yeah. But then... So uh, when you went to the airport, you could almost smell. I was glue. so paranoid. Yeah, like I left the suitcase open all night long yes. and was like kind of fan it and yeah. You know, and I said to the guy as well. I said to him like, if it smells of glue, and he was like, no, 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 it's fine. You're just being paranoid. So then I just didn't know. I didn't know what was real and what wasn't real. I yes. didn't know was I just being. And you was thinking yeah. every, everything has been paid off. Yeah, so I'm like, am I just being paranoid and it doesn't smell of glue? And I'm like, but it does smell of glue, and it's like maybe you just think that it smells yes. of glue, you know, because you know what you're doing mm. and. I don't know. So, yeah, so when I was like, handing it, so I went to the airport like the next day, got on the coach. There was a coach from the hotel that took us to the airport. As I was handing the suitcase over, like to put on the, when you're checking in, like I'm looking at the lady thinking she must be able to smell the glue, you know, and I'm just trying to stay calm. And then I'm just saying to myself, it doesn't matter if she can smell the glue. Everybody's been paid off. Oh, yes. Like, it's it's fine and i was looking i was thinking does she know is she one of the people you know she's looking at my passport and my boarding pass and everything and uh, i just i didn't know i thought maybe she knows maybe she's in on it like it's all it's all fine it wasn't no, no. <laughs> at what point the guards came to you i was in the departure line at the boarding gate so i just, I just sat down with my daughter waiting uh, to to board the plane, and I saw a couple of Guardia walking in, and I just I knew like I knew straight away that they were coming for me, and I just kept saying to myself the whole time, it's okay. But I knew that it wasn't like I just this this you feeling. Felt right away that it yeah, wasn't, just yes. the feeling. There was the whole time. The feeling was there the whole time. The whole time I was in Venezuela. The whole. The whole experience, you know, that this feeling was was there, and I just chose to ignore it because I didn't know what it was. So I knew that they were coming for me, and then, like on the table next to me was another family. It was like a a husband and wife and their kid. So the guardia went up to them, and I saw them show them the passports. And then the guardia left them alone and then they came to me. Um, they were all talking in Spanish, but they I knew that they wanted to see my passport. So when I showed them my passport, they asked me to go with them. 
And I was thinking, okay, this is right. This is all part of the plan well, because yeah, this course, is what yeah. the guy you know had said. But it still, like I said, it did it didn't feel right. And then they took me into a room, and my suitcase was on a table. Like it was such a it was such a bare room, and um, it just had like this really cold light, you know. And my naked, exposed suitcase on the table and they asked me if it was my suitcase that it was my suitcase and I and in my head I'm saying to myself okay this is fine they're just checking mm -hmm. that it's the right suitcase so that they can get it on the plane or whatever they need to do they're just checking that everything's right and then the one guard pulled out a knife and put the knife into the suitcase. And as soon as he did that, I was like, this is not, that's not, I'm, that's not supposed to be happening. Uh, and I think it was kind of like, that was the point when I was like, like this is not part of the plan. But yeah. And then, uh, so then he pulls his knife out. I think he licked the knife. Like, it was none of the kits back then that yeah. they have now. And he was like, ka, ka, ka. Shit, that's Fuck definitely... Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely not supposed to be happening. And uh, everything just all just came tumbling down around me at that point. Your daughter, like, did she understood, like, vaguely what was going on? or what, what? No, I told her... I mean, she was three years old. So I think that was my... My main goal then during all of this was to just, even though like I was panicking and in heat, was just to just try and like maintain some calm and and not panic her. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I just wanted to keep calm and so that she wasn't distressed. So and she was asking what was going on, like what are they doing, and I said that um there were some things in my suitcase that weren't supposed to be in there and that they were just sorting all of that out. Um, and she she accepted that. I'm, I'm her mum and, um, and I remained calm about it all and she just accepted um, everything that I told her. Yeah. So what happened after? I got, after that, I got taken to like a, a Guardia station it was, I think it was attached to the, I think it was there at the airport somewhere. I had a phone call with my embassy, first of all. They let me speak to my embassy. And my embassy, they just, right from the beginning, they told me exactly what was going to happen. Um, they basically said, you're fucks. Yes. Yeah, from the, right from the beginning. They said, right, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go to the police station you're going to go to prison you're going to get you're going to get sentenced to 10 years in prison there was there was just no messing around like they there was no they didn't think say like oh it's going to be a-okay okay. you yeah, get a lawyer we're going to help yeah so there, there was, was also no agreement with the uk that they could there like, was no yeah it's called repatriation yes. repatriation agreement yeah, there's no repatriation agreement. So they told you straight away. Yeah, right from the beginning. Gonna go to prison for ten years. Yeah. Uh, what was your reaction? I didn't believe it. Oh my god. Yeah. Yes. I think it's. I was in a state of shock. I didn't believe it for a year. Believe it, like yes. finally enough. Like I just, I couldn't realize it. Yeah, I couldn't. Like I think it was just my, my brain's way of coping with yes. like what was what was going on. Has um was it is it always ten years? Yeah, or, or like the yeah, yeah. amount doesn't matter. Well, there were some guys, there were some English guys in the prison that I was in, um, and they got caught with tons of it. They got a caught with um a huge container ship. They got ten years. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't it's, matter. Yeah, it's just a universal thing. I understand. Like, yeah, ten years. But I think maybe as well because. I had my daughter as well. I think I thought, well, they can't do that, and they'll put me on a plane tomorrow. And I, I, I don't. I just don't think I knew what was going to happen. Really, I think even then, I thought, well, they'll put me on a plane, and I'll go back to England, and I'll say, well, that was very naughty, and you shouldn't have done that. Yes. And I everything will be and fine. everything will be yeah. fine. 
Yeah. Um, but they didn't. They no. took you to the police station. Yeah. I stayed the night in the with the Guardia and I had my daughter with me. And then the next day, we just went on like this journey, like from place to place. And they were like taking fingerprints and they were doing tests on my skin mm -hmm. um, to see whether I had like drug residue on my skin. Yeah, and then they took me to the courts. There was a trial. Well, I not then, but okay. they not at that point. But then they took they took me to the courts because at court I can't remember. It was such a long time ago. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, and I think these points are so traumatic as well. Yes, that our brain decides to like shut off, don't they? Because obviously I got separated from. From my daughter. What was that moment? Well, this is what I'm saying. I can't. At that that actual moment, I can't remember. I remember the moment when I got reunited with her and separated again. But that moment when I think I vaguely remember someone saying that they were going to take her and she was going to be put in an orphanage whilst they figured out what was going on. But right now, I can't remember the details of it. Is it it's just for us. So yeah, 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 of course. Feels guilty at that Yeah, moment. of course. Yes. Yeah, it's the worst, like, it's the worst, one of the worst things. I've just completely let my child down and, and put her at risk and put her in danger and everything I've exposed her to because of my selfishness, because of my greed, because of my drug addiction. Yeah, it's just, uh, it was, I felt... It's everything, it's just suddenly, you know, what I've done is suddenly become, I've suddenly realised, you know, yes. what are you doing? What have you done? You now all the questions, all the things that I should have thought beforehand are suddenly hitting me now. And so I can imagine this was a, like an emotional moment also? Um, I think I kept it, I think I kept myself together because... Again, I didn't want to upset my daughter. I didn't want to, like, break down in tears. Like, when she'd gone, then, yeah, I was was crying. But, again, I think just think I was in this whole state of shock, like, the whole time. I kind of... I couldn't believe everything that was happening. Yes. I remember that I kept thinking that it was a dream and that I was going to wake up... And it was just all a bad dream. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There was no realisation point. Yeah, I just couldn't, like, comprehend. Like, my brain just literally just couldn't comprehend. I suppose part of that is owning up to your actions, isn't mm -hmm. it? And I just don't think I was able to, to, to do that at that point. Yes. And what happened? Where did it took you? So I went to the police station. Once I'd been separated from my daughter, which was insane... It was nuts. There was, it was so hot. They took my suitcase off me. They brought my, they brought, they'd give my suitcase back to the people that were taking me to the, to the police station. Yeah, without the, the drugs. Without the drugs yeah. in, yeah, but I had all my stuff in. But then they would put that, when we got to the police station, they put that in, um, in a side room. And they took me into this cell and it was just, you you just never see anything like it. There was, it was like just stone, stone walls. It wasn't very big. There were about 20 pretty much half naked Venezuelan women in there because it was so hot. Oh, yeah. Like the, the walls were wet from sweat and condensation and like it's dripping off, you know, sweat and everything. It's dripping off the ceiling. And it's just like sardines crammed into a sardine tin. So, uh, so massively overpopulated. And then there was a men's cell as well. I had to walk past them. And they were just like monkeys at a zoo, you know, just like crammed in again, you know, at the gates at the, you know, you've got to walk past the, bars and they're all hanging on to the bars like that there was like this little there was a, a small hole in the corner of the room and um if you were doing a wee 
yes. then that's where you did a wee. And there was no partition. It wasn't sectioned off or anything like that. It's just this, you know. There's little cell with, with there's, Yeah, there's woman. no privacy. And then if you needed to do a poo, did you had a, uh, a bucket and you, you had to put a carrier bag in the bucket and just squat over the bucket and oh. do a poo. Again, there's like just in the corner in corner of the room and then like and then afterwards oh it's so grim and then afterwards you had to tie the bag to like the gate and just like call the guardia to pick it up to pick it up and sometimes they would and sometimes they'd leave it there you know until until they felt like coming to get it it was grim so the situation here was horrible Mm. Yeah. Uh, how many months did you, have you stayed here? A few months. Okay, before yeah. going. What was the reason for that it took so long that you have to stay at this police station before going to prison? Um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I I don't know. It's just the just the process, I think. Yes. Um You pleaded guilty? Apparently so. <laughs> okay, you don't so know. So I got told, yes. yeah. I got to the court first of all because my daughter was going back to the UK. Okay. And my judge called me to court and called my daughter to court so that I didn't actually have to go into court. I I I thought that I was going to court, but they just put they put me in an office. My judge came in and said that um my daughter was being taken back to the UK. I was gonna get sentenced to ten years, so she was gonna let me see. Goodbye to my daughter. That was the last time seeing her. Yeah, yeah. So you and so you pleaded guilty in that trial. Well, I didn't oh. have trial then. Oh, like sorry, they yeah. took me back to the. They yes. took me back to the police station after that. Yeah. It was just to say goodbye to my daughter. Yeah. Then I got transferred to the main prison, to San Antonio prison. From there, I I can't remember how long I'd been in the prison for. How was your first impression? Of San Antonio. It was so strange because I was glad to be there because I'd been told what it was like. I kind of couldn't believe it. I'd seen my my British embassy. They'd come to see me and they told me the process. They said, right, you'll get transferred to San Antonio. San Antonio is much better than here in the sense that there's more open space. You're not crammed in on top of each other. You, You have freedom it's mixed prison there's men and women together you can interact with with each other but they said but there's it's violent there's guns and drugs and again I just couldn't kind of wrap my head around that and there was this girl in the police station a Venezuelan girl she was called Latina and she always used to say to me, she used to be, you San Antonio, fucky, fucky, mucho men, fucky, fucky. And I just, I couldn't get my head round yes. it, you know. I was like, okay, this, I don't understand. But when I got there, so I was definitely relieved to be moving on to the next part because I just think anything had to be better, better than this, than place you, you this the hellhole yes. that I was in. Anything had to be better than that. And when I got there, you know, there's like, palm trees and when you know and palm trees always make you feel good yes i think yeah. because they always they give you that kind of holiday vibe don't they and that sunny weather and so and there was like these palm trees and it was just all open space and everybody's walking around and there's men walking around yes. and i can see the prisoners walking around and i can just see like the the the, the freedom um but there's like all these guys on the roof and that was what was bizarre because it was. I was thinking like, why they're they're patrolling the roof and they've all got weapons on display. They've all got their you know, big shotguns and pistols and huge um, swords, but they just look like massively scraffing. So I'm thinking, I'm like, well, how come they're not wearing a uniform? And it's because they weren't um, guards. They were prisoners that were. Protecting themselves. Protecting their Crazy. their territory. Yes. Yeah. How were your first days? And well, the first day that I woke up, I was woken up with um, gunshot. Oh. Yeah, I was woken up straight away with gunshot, and then 
um, a siren went off, so I could, like an air raid, like a World War air raid. Yes. And then loads of the women was crying and screaming. And um, there were some English girls there, and they quickly explained to me that somebody had died, that one of the men had been shot. Like, we'd heard the gunshots, and they said, and when the air raid goes off, it means that someone's dead. And that's why all the local, the Venezuelan women, are crying and screaming because a lot of them have got their husbands or their sons or their family are in there. So they they don't know, you know, if it could be a member of their family. Um, and that just became a, a regular thing all the time. Like every day you'd hear gunshots, like on a regular occasion. But you kind of learned to figure out that it was nothing to worry about unless the the air raid the air if the air raid siren went off then you knew the doors would get opened in the morning like so you've got the women's section and then you've got two men's section and then you've got like the administration like the the center of the prison where the director's office is where the guard's office is mm-hmm. and the gate sites so the women's bit would get opened up by eight o'clock in the morning and then get closed again about, I think it'd be like eight o'clock at night. So between eight o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock at night, you can do whatever you want except leave. Okay. So it's like anything but you everybody want. Everybody was just free to yeah, go. And... Yeah. Yeah. There was no structure. There was no education. There's no jobs. Just everybody just was were hanging around. Yeah. People like you get and in, go in to see the boyfriends, you know, mm-hmm. and go, you just go over to the men's side and most people. And then the men were a bit more organized. So they would like organize games. They'd organize, you know, like, I don't know, they'd parties and volleyball competitions and. So crazy. It is yeah. Just, yeah. And there were, but, but the men are also a little bit divided in gangs, right? Yeah. So how does that work? They're separated. So okay. you've got two separate men's side, depending on the gangs and depending on usually like some kind of problems from the streets, you know, would depend on which side they would go on. Or sometimes, you know, if they had a, a major clash with, with somebody in that side, maybe for their own protection, they'd have to go to the to the other side Mm -hmm. there was a lot of politics involved there was like a guy that that ran everything um a prisoner and he just ran the whole he'd have a prisoner a guy on one side that ran his side what was his name alche Ah, okay he was called Yeah. yeah and he ran everything on his side and then you had a guy on the other side that ran his side and there was just a a lot of politics going on between them and they and there was so much drugs Drugs yeah. available everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's so much. So for you, it was also easy to... Yeah, it didn't take me long to get back into it. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the extreme things that happened in this prison? Yeah, so there was a war that um, went on for, I think it was about three days. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was... And even the Guardia wouldn't come in. They must have been, like, taking it in shifts or I don't know, but it went on for three days solid. And, like, right next to our our bit was one of the men's side, and they had these massive holes, like, the size of doorways. Mm -hmm. And when this war was going on, prisoners were bringing the, the dead and the wounded, like, through this hole, through our bit, to then get them to, like... The main hub of the prison, like the that, like the administration block. So the guards left. And they didn't come just, in. They didn't come. So you have like between the gangs. Yeah. And so there you were have everywhere. Yeah. So oh there's like God. you have like you've got prison guards and then you've got national guards. So the prison guards, if we call Ag- Agua Azul, Blue mm-hmm. Water, they lock themselves in their offices for their own safety. Yeah. Yeah. And then. The National Guards, Agua Verde, they, they just didn't come in because it was just too dangerous. Um, like at one point, someone threw a grenade. There was a uh, there was a machine gun and everything, everything was inside. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, and yeah. So it weapons. was all it was all inside, and it was all it wasn't spreading out of yes. the prison. And there's nothing the Guardia could 
could do about it at that point it was it was literally a war because there's like 400 men on one side and 300 men on another side all trying to kill each other with grenades and machine guns so i think the guardia were like okay we'll just you know let them kill each other and we'll deal with it afterwards oh when they've run out of ammunition or run out of steam or like the wounded were getting the, and the dead were being brought through this hole in the wall there was like a hospital area in this main kind of admin area but it's not really couldn't really class it as a hospital and it was full up um and the ambulance the ambulances from the hospital they wouldn't come because they they couldn't get in it's too just dangerous. it's too dangerous oh my god yeah so they were just left alone in a war yeah, zone yeah so they so they couldn't they wouldn't come in because it was too dangerous so these dead bodies were just left outside like and it's under the sun a couple of days until it was all over and the ambulance people could get in she oh. just was like surrounded by rotten decaying bodies and the national guards came in and they were pissed off like they need to now kind of show their authority yes because they, because something's happened and they've had no control over it so they came in and then they tortured the men it's like it's super hot in venezuela it's like not far from the equator it's very hot all day long all throughout the year there's a massive huge like courtyard it's massive it's like the basketball court and like bigger than that so they got all the men and they made them all lie down like face down from like the morning until night time on this concrete and then they were all like while all the men were let down you know all the guardia were like patrolling them with their big swords and like whenever any of the men like moved because they're scorching and burning and get like beaten oh, with the swords so yeah bad. yeah and then like quite often as well the guardia would line like certain certain prisoners i mean the guardia some of them were were bullies and would just do it like for, for fun. fun yeah oh my god yes and um but you i mean you could you could see which you could see which guardia enjoyed it and which ones didn't because they'd line sometimes they'd line the men up against the wall it wouldn't be all the men it would be some men for you know something that they hadn't done or whatever mm -hmm. and they'd line them up against the wall and they would get them to drop their trousers and then like beat them on the back of their legs and on their asses and stuff like that and for you was there a sort of point where you really felt rock bottom or what was your yeah totally um my mum had come to visit so I'd send my family, I'd send, well, I'd send my mum and my brother and sister, which had been difficult. And then I think it wasn't long after that, this war had happened. And I'd been there about a year. And I think it was kind of then when I acknowledged that I had a 10 year sentence. It took a whole year for it because every day I used to <laughs> every day I used to think that the next day somebody would come and get me and take me out of there. So it took a year before yeah. the organization came. Yeah, in. because it was just the circumstances, like the condi like what was happening in so for, bad, in front yeah. of me, and I just thought, okay, I I I thought that I was, I think because I was British and had a British passport. I, I thought that I was, I don't know, something special, I think, or that the British passport was something special. And I don't know why I thought I was different from the other British girls that had been there for seven years. But every day I used to just think the, the British embassy are going to come tomorrow and they're going to get us out of here. The British embassy are going to hear about this and they're going to say, like, oh, we can't have our, our Brits in there. But... The British, they don't care. They don't need to care either, really, because we're the ones that put ourselves in that situation. You know, that's that's the consequences of 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 the actions, isn't it? But that's how I got by for the first year was just like day after day after day, you know, just trying to cope and get to the end of the day was thinking, well, it's okay because they'll come tomorrow. But at this point, the realization yeah. kicks in. Yeah, so it, this kicks in that that's, that's not happening. 
I just couldn't bear the thought of and then I, and then I thought about my daughter and what I'd put her through and that guilt as well that um was good and I just thought she'd be better off without me you know I didn't want to feel the guilt and I just thought especially after the war and seeing you know these dead bodies and you know legs blown off and I just thought I just couldn't cope I just didn't see how I was going to get through that for another 10 years what happens after well, I took an overdose well obviously not enough because here I am yeah, today yeah, you woke up. Um, yeah but when I woke up were they trying to help you? Like, not really. No. They just left you. Yeah, apparently, like I was breathing and I was out for a few days. Oh. But they said that, like, the guardia were coming round and you're supposed to, like, get up and come out so they can, like, count the numbers. And I was just, like, unconscious in the bed, but they were checking on me and I was breathing and the nurse had come. And so, yeah, no, they just left me there. Yeah. They came round, like, a few days later. I think I came round with a whole different attitude I think really like at first I was just I was distraught that I was that I you know that I woke up and oh god here you know here I am yeah. you know this is real I'm still here I'm not dead and I was distraught so I had a moment I think where I just prayed with my whole heart and like with all of my being for some kind of godly intervention you know and for help I yes. think I'm getting all emotional thinking about it um what does it trigger it's just that connection with God I think you know that um that desperation that I had I don't think I've ever prayed for something with like you know I'm, I'm not I wasn't and I'm not a religious person, definitely a spiritual person now, um, but I, I wasn't then at all. And it was like every part of my being, every cell, every atom, you know, you could go into the quantum physics of it, but every part of my being was just calling out to a wow. higher power. Yes. Uh, for something you know you can't certain, take it anymore by your yeah, own yeah like you know and i was like just throw me a bone yeah. <laughs> like yeah. give me something you know if if this is what i'm going through and you're not going to let me die then give me something please um so and i was kind of like in this trance for for hours locked into it and then eventually I came out of it and applied for transfer. Like straight away, I was like, right, that's, I just had a, something in me saying like... I need to get out of here. Yeah, apply yeah. for a transfer. Now the thing is, like, there were people there that applied for transfer and they'd been waiting years and hadn't got out of there. Mm -hmm. and But I had nothing to lose at that point. Uh, and I'd kind of like... Um, like I'd said in my prayer, I'd said, I can't do it here like get me out of here and I'll stop taking drugs okay. you know like I, ca I can't stop taking them here now I'm caught in this web of drugs yeah, yeah in this cycle and I can't get out of it so get me out of here and the, the next place I go to like it in in exchange I mean I don't know if it works like that because the addiction in here was so badly was yeah it like it was worse than it had ever been was yeah. it also the crack or was it and yeah it was okay. yeah well it was something called bazooka ah, yes. um which is very cheap yeah it's yeah. so cheap and it's kind of like it's has exactly the same effect as crack but i think it's just like one process like okay. before or something like that yeah and it's just like so like what would cost like a hundred pound in england was costing the equivalent of like five pounds yeah so it was over so there. easily mm. yeah but you got transferred. Yeah. So tell like us about literally it. a week later. It's so yeah. good for you. Yeah, yeah. Because that, that for you that felt must have felt like a new start or? 100%. Okay. Yeah, totally. And it was odd because like some of the other people that had, had also that had applied for the transfer beforehand had been waiting. They didn't go. Okay. So yeah. It really felt like um, an opportunity 
um to get clean actually yeah it felt yeah. like an opportunity to get clean and it felt like a message from god that you know yeah. he'd heard me and then you know, it was and that he was that there was a god and that you know this omnipresence is real and it does exist and it heard my plea and that there was hope you know like i'd heard about this new place i'd heard it was better what was better in this new place? Because there was no men there. Okay. So, which meant no Wars. drugs. Yeah. And uh. not no drugs. It meant no guns, no violence, no gang warfare. Got there and there was education there. There was jobs there. Okay. There was structure there. It sounds there a lot was, better than yeah, San Antonio. Yeah. There was, there was routine yes. there. They had an internet cafe there. So you could go there every day and communicate. I could communicate with my mum and yes. emails and my person that was looking after my daughter. It was difficult because there were rules and restrictions. You know, I just come from this place that was very similar to the children's home. Yes. You know, that it was just a big, massive free fall. Yes. And it wasn't like that now. You know, you had to, you got locked in, you had to have a job or you had to have education. And if you didn't have that, you weren't allowed out of your cell mm -hmm. and you were locked in and and then obviously you'd like made friends you know I missed the guys you know I'd made friends with them but so it was just adjusting to a new routine but it was just um it was bearable mm -hmm. you know and just to get away from the violence was yes. um the best part of it I think and and I could see being able to get through that and at this point, there was also more re realization that you will stay there. So maybe there was more like... Well, I thought I was going to yeah. stay there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're gonna, <laughs> That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. So, so I thought, okay, like I got 10 years. I got nine more years to go. I, I can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't comprehend that in the last place, but I could see myself getting through and doing the nine, doing the nine years. Yeah. And we weren't there long like four months or something like that oh yeah really not long at all and then suddenly one day like and we had no warning it just came like one day like translado like pack your stuff you go in now it's like Why? what yes like what's going on and it wasn't anything personal it was nothing like it wasn't that high done anything okay it was because there was they were shipping loads of people like they were changing the prison i think and it was because i'd been sentenced and they were going to keep the prison just for people that hadn't been sentenced and they were awaiting sentencing so all the people that had been sentenced they were shipping them out where did where did you end up place called Medidad like I wanted to go back to San Antonio because I heard they were taking me to Medidad which again was a mixed prison and I thought well if I'm going back to that take I'd rather me to a place, take, I know, yeah. take me to a place because this was even yeah yeah the same take, yeah take me to a place I know so um yeah they shipped me to a prison called San Juan de Lagunillas okay which is in Medida which is right four hours away from the Colombian border so as soon as I learned that, straight away, I was like, I wonder if there's a way to escape. Everybody fantasizes about escaping that's in prison. Yes. You know, there's not one prisoner that doesn't dream about, you know, being out, being like escaping. Yeah, but I, I can imagine going to a place so close to borders. Like yeah. A... Yeah, it was like, okay, so this place is four hours away from from the Colombian border. I like, I, I, I wonder. Were people escaping at that point? Heard of stories from people there like, was in San mm, not successfully. Oh. Yeah, there was a couple of people in San Antonio and they'd escaped, but they'd got caught in the village and um, the consequences were not good. The Guardia had hospitalized them. Oh my god! Yeah, with yeah. the beat. So it was a big. The message was loud and clear. Yes. You know, if if we catch you escaping, as a sort of example. Yeah. As, don't try to mm -hmm. do this. So can you walk us through the, your plan to escape, even after knowing all this? Wow. I mean, I think it was just a kind of daydream at first. Then I got there and it wasn't, to begin, it wasn't as bad as San Antonio. 
in the sense that the violence wasn't is so difficult um because there wasn't this constant violence and constant wars going on between the men i mean there was stuff going on but it was very shielded from the women and it wasn't as bad as san antonio but there was a girl that got shot in the head like in there was some there was something going on on the girl side um and there was a girl that got shot in the head by another female prisoner so so again it was not like the yeah, most safe environment not to be. at all no and then i ended up having a relationship with a prison guard yes yeah, so how there. did that happen yeah and we loved each other we loved each other so we really did so yeah, much so was yeah. it for you like love at first sight or was it like first thinking Pretty maybe much. it's nice to know no. you no wow like i was really attracted to him okay yeah i i fancied the pants off him yes. like i really did um i thought he was he was so handsome especially in his uniform as well <laughs> <laughs> especially in his uniform you know he was he quite smiling again yeah now. <laughs> he was um he's quite well built and mm -hmm. he wear this white shirt what was and his name jose jose yeah okay. jose um and he's always have this like serious face yes. on like all the other guards they'd always be playing and joking and and uh, he had an attitude you know because okay. he didn't want to be there okay. he'd got into trouble in the other prison that he was working in and he'd been shipped to work in this new prison so he had a he had an attitude but i just liked his seriousness and um like i said just find him really attractive so yeah so me i started f flirting with him And I had a, I had a phone. Mm -hmm. um, Legally? Yeah, I had a mobile phone. Okay, yeah, yeah. but not like legal. No. No, of course. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, so I gave him my phone number. <laughs> That's so <laughs> funny. That, like, you give your phone number to a guard. Like, yeah. Knowing that you're, you're, not not to have, to you're not supposed to have phones. Yes. Yeah. Well, he was like, I knew he'd be all right because... Um, He was flirting back. Yeah, of course. You know, you know I was that, flirting yes. and yeah. he was flirting back and mm -hmm. we had some banter going on. So if he's flirting back, then he's definitely not going to mind about a mobile phone because yes. you shouldn't be, you know, if you're correct, then you're correct in all areas. And so, you know, he was not correct. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so I gave him my phone number and then he, He just started ringing me, like straight away. He was ringing me like every night. And then he was sending me text messages, like so many, like bombarding me, like all with text messages. And then he was always sending me phone credit. Um, yeah, because my, my question would have been, uh, where did your money came from? Yeah. Um, well, the embassy came and bought us many sometimes. And I got a shop running in okay. there um so i was making money okay so yeah some work yeah uh, was it in a prison or outside a prison in the prison okay in the prison in the women's bit um and then so jose would just like and then he would just come over like he would just come over as much as he could or find out where i was going to be because it, it wasn't so open there you couldn't just walk around freely so he would find out where i was going to be or he'd let me know like oh so the girls are going to be allowed to go over to the men's side today or they're going to be allowed to go to education today or they're going to you know go here go there. so he'd come and he'd just like orchestrate his shift yes. so that he could be like wherever um, like really i was <laughs> it, 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 in a strange situation it is it yes. is really romantic he and he was like sending me presents all the time he was sending me teddy bears <laughs> and they'd be calling me at the gate um and they'd be uh i mean he brought, got me this great big yellow teddy bear yes he paid for some mariachis to come in from the street and serenade me so, what's that Mariachis are the you know the Mexicans with the big hats oh with the God. things that go around the restaurants. He and, paid them you know, to come into prison to play for you for these two mariachis so to come into the prison. He paid the guards off to let them in, paid the mariachis <laughs> off, and then because the women's bit was higher up, so there was this bit where 
who came out of the women's bit into the kind of backyard, which was all open. And in this backyard, there was a wall there and you stood up and you could look down like mm -hmm. onto the onto the road, like not the, it was an internal road yes. in the prison. And that was the bit where like officers were there, but it's where all the guys would throw over like all the contraband. They'd throw over the contraband over the wall to us with the drink and the drugs and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But you could look down. So I remember I was in the courtyard and all of a sudden there's like a big commotion and all the girls are screaming <laughs> and they're yeah. all shouting me and they're telling me to come to the wall and like what's going on and I go out there and Jose sat there because he's like on shift outside the offices and he's like sat there looking all smug with his, himself and there's these two mariachis there that just start like singing and yeah, yeah, serenading. So everybody knew about this relationship? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What well, about opinion? So there was, it, there was a divide of opinions and it was Jose that had made it like... Yeah. He was so brazen, like he would, because he didn't, he just didn't care. Yeah. You know, he didn't care. Which is nice thinking about your story at the beginning being like this, this silent relationship. Mm. Now he just being open and proud of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a divide. So there was like two sets of guards, really. And there was like one set of guards that, I mean, Venezuelans are very passionate. South Americans, you know, they're so passionate. You know, they kill for love. Um, so there was like one set of guards and they were so on our side, they could see that this was love. Because there were the other guardias that were fooling around with people. But, you know, this really was, you know, I, I loved him and he loved me. So like the one set of guards, they would do everything they could so that we could spend time together, do the shifts that he, let him do the shifts that he yes. wanted to do, come and get me. But then there was another set of guards that were totally against it. We we called them the, the brujas, oh. and which means witches. Oh. And actually what we did when we, when we were so naughty, when I escaped, when I left, yes, Jose came with me. Well, I know we'll get to this, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Let's, but, let's go. Yeah. but when we were in London and we got a postcard yes. and we sent it to the Brujas <laughs> as a fuck you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so let's yeah. let's go to the point where you and Jose started planning his escape. What led mm. up to the to the plan? Well, he said it, first of all, like, it was, I actually remember it was like the very first, like one of the first phone calls. He was like, oh, maybe I'll help you escape one day. Yeah. And we were just like laughing and joking about it, you know. As the, the relationship developed, it, the love just became, it was like all consuming. Like we just had to be with each other. And this time that we were to get getting together just wasn't enough mm -hmm. and it just felt like we're gonna explode you know we just yes. it's like it's like that again like our atoms inside were like magnets that were just like demanded to yeah. be together so i'd been in prison by this point by about four years so jose said to me suggested that i apply for my day releases he knew a lot of people that um, I needed certain paperwork and things to be signed off and people to run around to take papers to my judge. And Jose, was he was able to do that. Yeah, he could help you out with that. Yeah, yes. and he could help with a lot of things. So if you get any day releases, you need somebody on the outside. The prison won't do it for you. You have to do even getting your papers from the prison to the courts and stuff. The, the prison doesn't do that. You've yeah. got to have someone doing all that for you. Um, and you need people to say that you can stay with them and that you can work for them. And so, you know, Jose helped me a lot with that and um i also had a another friend there as well that was helping me with all of that so i got my i got my day releases like authorized to go to work yeah yes, i was supposed like to a, yeah yeah okay <laughs> but i didn't have a job oh, like you... yeah we they thought that i had a job at a hairdresser's so um this we'd had this hairdresser to sign all this paperwork to oh, say you just paid yeah, them off yeah you just paid them off but, yeah. yeah but we didn't and then you could do like fun stuff 
Yeah, her. yeah. Oh, okay. So it, it took our relationship to a whole nother level. And the thing is, as well, Jose was like, at the time, his friend was a director. So I could stay out for days on end. Like they'd finished work, the Jose and the prison director. director then they'd get on the bus <laughs> into the village. I'd meet them off the bus. Yes. And I remember there was a carnival going on one time. So we went round the carnival. Jose, like we were all drinking and Jose paid for everything. You know, he bought, we went to a bar and he bought like a bottle of whiskey and like got the um, director like drunk. And then he just asked the director to phone up the prison to say that I wasn't going to be back for the <laughs> night. So, so, crazy. so yeah, so then the director so phoned surreal. up and said that I wasn't going to be back for like three days, I think it oh was. So I'm, and I just get so much time out. Um, I had I managed to make a friend that was a doctor and I guess I he'd write me sick notes all the time. So I was spending like hardly any time in the prison, which was I, people were starting to get pissed off. Yeah, so yeah. That they started to get pissed off. Yeah. I, I can imagine because yeah. they were locked up. Yeah. So you had to speed up the plan because releases were taking off, right? Yeah, well I was gonna have my day release taken away from me. Yeah, we had a phone call one day. Well, I got a We got stopped in time one day. The new that director went, a new director came. Ah, uh, that was the thing. Mm. Yeah. And the new director had heard about this relationship and she'd ordered that if we got saw in time together for her to get arrest like to arrest me. So I'd been arrested and taken back and I wasn't allowed out for a day. But it's not up to the director, it's up to the judge to revoke your day releases. Mm -hmm. So she had to let me out again. But we were right and we got a phone call saying that the judge was going to have to take away my day releases. Yeah, so you had to speed up the we process had to, about yeah, planning to yeah, escape. Yeah, yes. so I mean, we'd been talking about it and we'd been starting to put the wheels in motions, but we yes. kind of weren't ready at this point. But we, yeah, we had to, we had to go for it. Yeah, so mm. tell us about this day. Oh my gosh, like... It just went wrong from the beginning, although I had a happy ending. There was um, an absolute downpour of like biblical proportion. It was almost like the deluge all over again, yeah. like that everything was just flooded. And um, I'd got on the bus. So I left the prison as if I was going to my day release. Jose was leaving a little bit later, finishing his shift of working. And then we'd arranged that we'd meet each other at a Hido bus station. And that's like the last stop before you cross the border. And now I'm not even supposed to be there because it's out of my area. Like, because I'm on day release, I'm not supposed to like go out of a certain zone. Mm -hmm. And a Hido is definitely like far out of this zone. So I've got to try and get there undercover without um, any guardia yeah, recognizing like, me. Like disguises yes. and stuff, yeah, hoods and things like that. But um, so I had a route planned. But because of this um, flooding, I couldn't follow the route because... There had been like an avalanche on the mountain, so the bus couldn't go that way. So then it went another way. Then I tried to get a taxi and the taxi got as far as it went and then the taxi couldn't get any further because okay. of the flooding. Um, and it was just, I didn't think, and we, I didn't have a phone. We'd sold our phones. Okay, because we wanted, be yeah, well, because of the money. Like we just wanted <sighs> as much money as we possibly could. So you so could also not yeah. like text or say. Like, so yeah, so um, we couldn't even communicate with each other. Did you had your passport? Yes. Oh, you did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because of the work. Yes. I understand. I'd asked for the passport. I'd gone to my embassy and told them that I'd been given my day releases and that I wanted to get a job and that I couldn't get a job because I didn't have any ID. So they sent you from yeah, this new passport? Yeah, I think they probably knew. <laughs> yeah. yes. I think they probably knew. Okay, so you yeah. were leaving with this taxi stopped? You yeah. your passport and some money? Yeah, so then couldn't get in the, the taxi. Then I tried another bus. And then we got to this river and the river had burst its banks 
and the bus didn't want to go through the river. But I was watching and there were Guardia everywhere. Are and by scared? this point, yeah, because by this point I was totally out of my like zone that yes. I'm supposed to be in. And uh, but I was watching there was like four by four trucks and I watched them like and they'd kind of figured out a route through this to cross this river. So the bus driver wasn't going to do it. And I went up to him and just pleaded with him. Like my life and freedom depends on this. I didn't tell him that. I just pleaded with him to go through the river and said like, look, like follow, watch what the way that those four by fours are going. And then you, know, you go the same way. And then it's like everybody else on the bus was kind of like encouraging him to as well. So... And and my freedom is on the other side of that river. Once we've yeah. got on the other side of the river, like the bus station's pretty much like there. So he did it and we got through the other side of the river and uh, everybody just like burst into applause like once yes. he got through to the other side. I think I was the happiest person <laughs> yeah. on there for sure. And then got to the bus station and it was really weird actually because I got there like four hours late and Jose... Was, was there. Left after you. He left after me. And he'd left about an hour after me and gone straight there, no problems. Okay, so he was waiting for you. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But he had no phones to like text. Yeah, or... yeah. And um, I didn't know if he was going to be there. And he, a friend of his had come as well, as well. Another prison guard, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> it was a friend of ours, yeah, to keep him company. And it was the other prison guard... Jan Hardo, that I'd um, that I saw first, uh, and I was just so happy to see him because I, I just yeah. you know it's a really busy bus station. Yeah. And I'm just like oh my god, you know. Next thing you know, he walks past. He's really happy to see me, and he takes me straight to Jose. And then you, because you are also traveling separately because of reducing the risk. Yeah. Now you're together, but yeah. you still needed to cross the border to Colombia. Yeah. What happened? So we got. Um, I don't think we'd actually plan too far what we were going to do there. We just knew get to Hedo. And then we got a taxi with a couple of Mexicans that were going to Colombia as well. So crossing the border, that, that must have felt so... Yeah, it was terrifying. Yes. Yeah, it was really scary. But you had your passport, but were you just yeah. sitting in a taxi like hiding? Yeah, yeah, but I can't really show them my passport because... They were not looking for you already, or... No, but the okay. thing is, like, um, so the National Guards, they go on rotation. So they might be working for, like, three months in the prison. Uh, and they might be working in an airport. Then they might be working so at a border, cross you. border crossing. Yeah, so it was this big fear yeah. of, um, of being recognized. But we got to the border and i think i was just like in the back like hood up and everything like pretending to to be asleep and a lot of people just do this quick border crossing to um hero to kukuta because kukuta is like this a lot of go there for like shopping and stuff so the mexicans like they, i mean they didn't know that what was going no, on no no but they just said like i mean i wonder if they were up to something as well you know oh, i think maybe, yes. i think it was just a whole taxi of people up to dodgy things <laughs> oh I you think. don't know everybody's I don't story know, exactly oh, I but um, when we got to the border and they were asking for the passports and stuff the mexicans just said oh she's just uh she doesn't speak spanish she's just uh uh, a gringa um we're just sharing a taxi with them we're just doing going to Ukta for the day and coming back and the and they were just they just waved us through it was just like the sound? big oh it was just like they waved us through and then we got to this sign saying like welcome to Colombia and as soon as I got to that sign I was like this this is it isn't it like I'm free it's it's over like I'm not going back to prison. I can't get caught now. Like you're in different countries. I'm in so. a different country. Yeah, and it was just like the just this huge, massive um, sigh of relief. Hmm. And so you had this plan together to take a plane. Yeah, to Spain. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So we were supposed. Our plan was we were going to go to Spain. There was a Spanish prisoner in the prison, and we'd 
been talking to him and told him what we were doing. And he said that he had family in Spain and that they had a hotel and that when we got to um, Spain, he gave us a photo number and he told us to ring the number. We could go and stay with his family in this hotel and that we could work in exchange for staying yeah. there. So that was our plan to do that. But before that, you needed to like cross the immigration Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I <laughs> forgot about that bit. Yeah, so we had to go through um, the immigration, but the problem was we hadn't got our passport stamped. So we had no no entry stamp on how we'd got into Colombia. So I knew that this, I had a feeling that this was going to be an issue. So I said to Jose, look, let's check in like super early, like as early as we can, so that if there's any problems, we've got, time to sort it out so we got like arrested straight away and they knew that something was up they separated us they were like they were really angry as well okay. it, was, it was like as if we'd done something to them personally they were like super angry they were fuming they wanted to know like how we'd got into the country and why didn't we have these stamps on our passports so we um we had a story ready for them And we told them that we'd come in from Venezuela. We just played dumb, that we didn't know that you needed to get them stamped. You know, we said that we were boyfriend and girlfriend, that um, we lived in Venezuela. Um, I'd met him, you know, I'd lived there for five years. I'd just met, a made up story. Yeah, yeah, I'd met him on yeah. holiday. But like, we tried to stick to the truth as much as possible yes. to make it simple. But yeah, that I'd met him on holiday five years ago and we were going on holiday together and we wanted to spend some Yeah, we'd spent some time in Colombia and then we I said I had um family in Spain and we were going to go there. So um they didn't believe us. And they thought this was so ironic. They thought that we were smuggling drugs. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, all yeah. All so they, again. yeah, so they like tore our suitcases apart and they didn't find anything in there. So then they asked me if I would consent to go into hospital and have be an X-rayed. Yeah. So I said, yeah, absolutely. Can we go now? I can't. Okay. <laughs> I'll pay They for a taxi. They probably never had somebody say, so, yeah, so, okay, let's yeah. go now yeah. because we need to get on a plane. Yeah, I was like, oh, I'll pay for a taxi because like, I know, I imagine that Colombia was very similar yes. to Venezuela. And I know things like Guardia Transport and things like that can be time consuming yes. and long. So I was like, okay, yeah, let's go now. I'll pay for a taxi. You can handcuff me, you know, because if we go there now, maybe we can go there, get x-rayed, and I can come back and can still yeah. get a plane. So you know? at that point, they must have thought yeah. there will be no trucks. <laughs> yeah, they were like, they didn't even take me to hospital. Oh. They were like, because I was just too, um, too keen. So... And they just came and like something's like something's up. So I just thought, okay, they we need to give them something because we're kind of insulting their intelligence. And that I think I felt that's how like that's how they were taking it that we thought they were stupid. So I ended up saying to them, okay, look, there is something, but it's not drugs, and it's nothing to do with Colombia. You know, there's it's got nothing to do with you or your governments and it's and then it's not drugs and I just wanna go, you know, we just wanna go home. How much will it cost to sort okay. this put this problem out? Um and there was like it was two immigration guards and we paid them like two hundred dollars. We had American we had some American dollars on us. We paid them two hundred American dollars each to, to just, just to just let us get on the plane. So yeah. four hundred dollars. Yeah. As a ticket to freedom. Yeah. yeah. So oh, yeah. you went on a plane and you already told us that you went to Madrid because yeah. working at the hotel and yeah. staying there together with Jose. Yeah. So actually, how was the feeling coming in Spain and having sort of your freedom back? Well, it was great, but it was so good, like on the plane and stuff. But I, I, I really felt for Jose at this point because I thought this is a, like just like how. South America had been a whole new world to yes. me. I was suddenly aware that I was now taking this guy, like, you know, he's such a family, but he hadn't told his family or anything. He left you know, everything. He for left love. everything. Yeah. And I knew that I was now taking him into like my 
yeah. world. But when we got to Spain, like this guy wasn't there and we didn't get the job and the hotel thing didn't exist. And oh so we were God. just kind of like stranded, like, what are we going to do? And it was Jose that came to the rescue because he had a friend that he was working with that had a brother in Spain, in Bilbao. So he spoke to his friend and his friend spoke to his brother and his brother said, yeah, I've got a spare room, come here. So we went to Bilbao yeah. and stayed with this guy. Um, and we thought we'd get jobs and make a life there. And then I was going to send for my daughter. But we couldn't get work. Like, we tried so hard, but they just had, like, an amnesty. So there had been, like, all these illegal Latin Americans there working. And there'd just been an amnesty. And they'd been, like, given papers and were working. And, like, employers were told that... If anybody was caught employing anybody illegally, there were going to be massive fines. So everyone was just too scared. So um, Jose couldn't get work. I thought I'd get work easily because I was pretty much bilingual then. I could speak Spanish and yes. English. I couldn't find work. I think we were there for like nine months or something. We just started running out of money. So I said to Jose, if we could get back to England, we'd be fine. I was like, my government will take care of yeah they will take care of me they will give me somewhere to live they will give me money yes. until we can until we get a job and sort of things out so that was really interesting because i phoned up the i wanted to know i'd be like right let me find out what my legal status is like what's gonna what happens if i go back to the uk are they gonna send me will they send me back to venezuela will i go to prison in the uk mm -hmm. like i literally had no idea what the what the legal status was so this is crazy. I phoned up the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London and asked them, like, what would happen if I came back to the UK? And I remember them saying, well, you can't come back to the UK because we haven't signed the repatriation agreement and you've still got five years left to serve on your sentence. So I said, you do know that I'm not in prison <laughs> in Venezuela, don't you? They had no idea. They nobody were, told them. Nobody told them. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so I said, what do, what do I say? They were like, what do you mean? I said, I'm I'm not there. And they said, well, where are you? I said, you don't need to worry about that. Um, but I'm not in Venezuela and I'm not in prison. Yeah. Um, so I just want to know, like, what the situation is. Can I come back to England? They said that they didn't know and they wanted contact details. So I wouldn't give them contact details, but I gave them some contact details of a family member of mine and said let let them know yeah. like what, what's up what's yeah. up um and then a week later i find out that they'd spoken to venezuela and venezuela had said that as long as i didn't return back to venezuela for the duration of my sentence they didn't care they weren't interested um because it costs them too much money mm -hmm. you know and the british embassy doesn't give them money so yeah. they're probably like relieved that i'm gone and then because i hadn't broken the law in England, England, like I wasn't, oh uh, yeah, I wasn't. They weren't going to put me in prison. They can't put me in prison in England because I haven't broken for what? When I haven't broken the law in England, so yeah, so I was free to go back to the UK. <laughs> it's yeah, one of the most craziest things. Yeah, so they just told you, yeah, you can just yeah come back you and just, nothing will happen to you. Yeah. Okay, so oh, yeah. that's what you did. That's what I did. Yeah. yeah, and and Jose came with me as well. Yeah, yeah. And how was it coming back to England after all of this? Oh, I just wanted to see my daughter. That was yeah. like that then was just all I could think about. Because what happened to her? She my friend looked after her. Your friend, yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. four and a half years. Yeah, yeah. They have like such a good relate. Even now, they yeah. have like a really good relationship. How was yeah. the first time seeing your daughter again after all these years? Oh, I was so emotional because she didn't recognize me. Yeah, she didn't know. So I went around to the house and she was playing outside so I was talking to her and she just had no idea who I was and then I asked her I was like do you know who I am and she said no and I said do you know my name she said no and then I told her my name I said my name's Natalie and she just stopped like dead and just looked at me and she said are you my mum oh yeah and then she just like dropped what she was doing and ran inside the house, like my friend's house. Because she called my friend mum by that point. Yes. She's like, mum, mum, <gasps> my mum's here. That's so yeah, cute. Yeah, so it was all, uh, it was all very overwhelming for everybody. For me, 
in a key for my poor friend because she didn't know that I'd escaped either. Oh, so, you just yeah came down. Today. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just phoned her up. Like I phoned her up that morning. Like the boat. I got off the boat. I went from Santander to. I think it was Santander to Plymouth or something yes. like that, or Portsmouth. And I got off the boat and then phoned her up and said that I was there and could I see um, Nikita. Nikita, yeah. And she had a very similar response <laughs> to, the, to the embassy. What do you mean? You're in, but you're supposed to be in prison for another five years. And I was like, yeah, no, I escaped. Um, she just, she put the phone down on me. <laughs> it was like, she, yeah, uh, she couldn't uh, cope are with you it. Me? Yeah, she, uh, she hung up and put the phone down on me. And then, so I got to Gloucester and then phoned her again. And she said, well, you better come round then, hadn't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then that was it. And then we just worked together after that. She said afterwards that it was just such a shock for her that she just didn't know how to handle it. And she loved my daughter like her own then yeah, of as well yeah so it was all you know she was like am I just going to come back and take my daughter away and so it was already up in the air but we just worked really well together that's beautiful for for Nikita to come back to me at a steady it was Eve that suggested it in the end I think in the end it was Eve was like don't don't you think it's about time we have your kid back yeah. I remember saying like I'd got a job and I'd got a flat and um, my daughter had been coming to stay with me at weekends. Yeah, so and build yeah, up the relationship yeah, again. so we really did it like a, a pace that was um, good. good for good for Nikita. So how's the relationship now with your daughter? I want to say it's pretty good. Yeah, we have we've had moments. Uh, we've got a really open relationship um, that a, a lot of parents don't have with their children. Um, there's not any secrets. She pretty much comes to me with everything that's going on, especially if she needs help with something. We clash a lot, but that's just our personalities. But yeah, we've, I'd say we've got a, I mean, we, we've was got she, a lot of work to do on it still. Was she still, um, she blaming you for no she'd never blamed me for venezuela okay. no she was like instantly she's always she's even we've spoke about it loads of times and she's got she harbors no bitterness or yeah. anger towards me she's really grateful to eve for which really helps situation yeah, is so that, yeah, that your friend just yeah like... it really helps that she didn't just get taken into the care of social services oh. and passed around you know she went to someone that she knew and this is sort of had a nice childhood yeah, yeah, yeah and had a nice life with them so all credit to eve for providing her with that because eve had her own stuff going on jose at this point uh was in england new country yeah, yeah. how was it for him and are you still together or how does so um, it was really difficult for him. He really struggled because he couldn't speak the language. I mean, he did in the end. He was there for three years and he couldn't work because he was there illegally. Yeah. And um, he overstayed. He shouldn't have been there that long. And that was a big thing for Jose. Like he, uh, I think it's a, I don't know if it's just generally a male thing or it's definitely a, a Latin male thing that he needed to be or feel like that he was the provider yeah. and he wasn't able to like i was working um i was working full time i bought a house i was paying the mortgage i was out a lot because of my job i had to take clients out quite a lot and it was really tough for him so he just started getting i think he felt really isolated and super jealous and not being able to provide just really kind of like stripped his identity away from him um so he was really struggling so and when he we talked about having kids we went to try and get married and we couldn't get married because he has to have a marriage license and you have to apply from that from the country that you're coming from so we had to apply for it from Venezuela. So we talked about it and we said, okay, we'll go back to Venezuela because we were having problems at this point anyway, but the problems were 
based around all of this, yes. you know, because like you couldn't work. And, yes, yes, and all of this. So we were like, okay, well, go back to Venezuela, get the papers. We can have this, we can have a break and mm-hmm. a space apart from each other. You can get your papers, come back with the papers. Yeah, because you were not allowed to go to Venezuela, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. But like, you come back with the papers. Let's just see how it goes, you know, let's see if once those problems are solved, if the relationship can get back to how it was. But then, so he went and, but then what happened was when he was at Heathrow, he got stopped by immigration and they put um, a big black mark on his passport to say that he wasn't allowed to come back into the country for five years. So you were stuck. You can't yeah, go to Venezuela. I can't go and there. He wasn't able to come yeah, to England. Yeah, and we appealed it. Yeah, but we lost the appeal. All right. Yeah. So, so that was sort of beginning of the end. Yeah. Do you still have contact? Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really weird because it's been twenty years now, yeah. um, and we still speak to each other regular fair you know every few months or something yeah that's yeah. nice yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i think so i mean i'm he's in a relationship and he's had children and i'm in a relationship and i love my partner like so much but he knows that i'm he knows that i was in this relationship with this prison guard and what he did and he knows that we have contact and yes but you know it's all open yeah yeah, yeah. But that's nice right if yeah yeah because i don't get along exactly you know and um he was like the first kind of like real love yeah and kind of positive relationship that mm-hmm. i had had and it's he did so much for me that n- nobody else is ever going to be able to do your story is about hope and never giving up and yeah. continue. Yeah. So what will be like your main takeaways you could provide our listeners with? So um, what I always try and say is I think to just, just always keep going, like never give up on yourself. And especially like no matter how many times it takes, because sometimes we can, we can be in these really dark places and you just think that there's no hope there and can you can't see a way out but there is a way out you know I just think don't ever give up on yourselves and and if you pick yourself up and everything's all right but then something goes wrong again again just just keep picking yourself up because with the right intentions everything can be good again but it takes work and it takes time you know you can't just expect things to change overnight and it's a really long process and it can take years but just just keep going and keep going and keep going and and everything will be okay do you also think that your your story like changed your perspective on like freedom and what it is to like have your freedom um so so much like, like my I've got a book. Yeah. Um, it's called um, Escape from Venezuela's Deadliest Prison. It's available on Amazon. And I'll also put a link uh, for the listeners who would like to read that. We'll put a brilliant. link in there. Yes. Thank you. And in there, it really explains a lot in graphic detail the atrocities that I witnessed over there. Now, you just wouldn't... I th- you just can't believe that these things go on in the world. So when I've seen these things with my own eyes, it's just giving me, it's opened my mind so much and given me a whole different understanding that not everywhere is the same as here mm-hmm. and the suffering that can go on. If I can ever do anything, to, like if when I come across foreigners in the UK... I'll always do whatever I can to help them because I was that person, Yes, you know, and people were so kind to me and so helpful to me. So I think one of the biggest things that I learned from it and to and can say to people is to just, to just be kind. Like you never know what someone's come from or what they're going through. And, you know, it can be a lonely world. So just think if we can just be kind to one another, then yeah. we can just make, make the place a little bit better. I think that's beautiful. To, uh, thank you. With. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your incredible story. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to Day Survives. Let us know what you think of this episode. 
If you're inspired by this unique and extraordinary survival story, please follow or subscribe to our podcast and check out our social media for more stories like these. Until next time, take care and don't miss the next episode. When the Nazis would come in, they haven't got much of a future there and obviously they'll be slaughtered. His last words to my mom were, save the children and we never heard them again. Dig out a pit and then move in. And we moved into that pit for nine long months. For how yeah, many we days? came back to a desert, basically. 25,000 Jews, and out of the 25,000 Jews, only 30 people came out alive. Nine children, and the three mm. of us, my two brothers and myself, are part of the three people, yeah.